World Wide Web brought the great leveling its early pioneers dreamed of. Dr. Alex Krotowski investigates the virtual revolution now on BBC Two and on BBC HD. Africa, the birthplace of mankind. But it's not the past that brings me here, it's the future. Africa has just been plugged into broadband. And as the World Wide Web grows and spreads across the continent, it's transforming all that it touches. The small town of Abiriu in Ghana is just one of the latest to be hooked up to the globe. I'm traveling with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the man who invented the web. It's 20 years since he made his breakthrough, and now the divide between the digital haves and have-nots is shrinking fast. I think the web is about connecting humanity. Now that we've got to the point that 20, 25% of the world are using it, then suddenly the question is, uh, what about the other 80%? This community center may not look like much, but it's the new frontier of this virtual revolution. It was a little bit like going back in time to when people first came across the web. We wouldn't, in the early days, days have been anything like as presumptuous as to say, how can we make sure this gets to the furthest reaches of rural Africa? But what exactly is it that we've created over the last 20 years? What does it mean? Is our wired digital world a blessing or a curse? If the web does take root in Africa as it has done elsewhere, then this will be the next continent to be reshaped by the digital revolution. But how has the web affected us in the 20 years since it was created? And what does that mean for the future of the people here and the majority of the world who aren't yet connected? The web is the defining technological revolution of our lifetimes. Almost two billion of us are now online. And in the 10 years that I've been studying the web and writing about it as a journalist, I've seen it take our world and shake it apart. The web has created unimaginable wealth, yet encouraged millions to work for nothing. It's challenged authority, yet allowed regimes to spy and censor as never before and it's been blamed for creating a generation of web addicts. It opened up new realms of knowledge. In this series, I'll be meeting all the pioneers and key players. Everybody from Google to Facebook, Twitter to Amazon. The people who've helped bring about this seemingly unstoppable leveling of power, culture, and values that's having such an impact on all of our daily lives. Well, the web is how mankind communicates nowadays. It's like the internet has become a brain. It's the smartest brain in the world. It is an empowering tool that has more potential than any other that human civilization has ever developed. The world is just going to keep on getting more and more open. There's going to be more information available about not everything. This is astounding technology, and we should just take a moment to celebrate the power and the reach that it gives us. And so this is the story of the web. But it's more than that. This is also the story of how the web is remaking our world. It's been more than two centuries since we last witnessed anything of the same scale and speed as the upheaval now being ushered in by the web. The Industrial Revolution was powered by what was then a radical new technology, steam. And now the web heralds the next great revolution. Why? Well, because it does for information what steam once did for physical force. It supercharges it. The web allows anyone to publish and to distribute words, images, videos, and software globally, instantly, and virtually for free. A quarter of the planet now uses the web. 
On any given day in the British Isles, over 35 million of us will log on. For the first time on television, using a unique data sample of 8 million of those people, we can track exactly how we are in the grip of the web. The web is where we spend our money, around a billion pounds a week. Britain's most active e-shoppers in Swansea, with Kirkwall and the Orkneys in second place. It's where we fall in love, with five million of us using a dating website every month. Manchester and central London have proportionally the most online lonely hearts. It's where we get our sexual kicks. Surveys have suggested up to 40% of British men view web porn. The highest density of visits to adult sites is in Harrogate, with Bromley close behind. And the web is where we express opinion. 18 million of us read blogs. Dumfries the least, West London the most. The web is a revolution. It's been hailed as the great leveling of humanity, a new frontier that gives us all equal access, equal voice, equal potential. The pioneers who paved the way for the web thought of it as the ultimate empowering tool, and so it came wrapped in an attitude, an online ideology that wants to give power to the people. The internet is a kind of rebellion. These people were opposed to the notion of hierarchy and authority. The people who originally created the internet were, by and large, social misfits who wanted to go on being social misfits. In a way, the libertarians have found their way to a space that is perfect for them to play out their ideas. It has completely blown apart and leveled access to communications and collaboration. The web is a great leveler, of course, is, is one of the goals of the web. In this film, I want to explore how the dream of leveling is playing out through the web. How it's overturning long-held notions of ownership, value, and expertise. How it's challenging business models. And how the equality promised by the web clashes with human nature, our innate desire to profit and control. It's about the meaning of this conflict and about how that has helped to create the web, this messy, beguiling, and hugely powerful phenomenon that we know today. The ultimate claim for the web as an empowering tool is that it blows open access to knowledge. To find out how, I've come to one of the new pillars of the American educational establishment. No, not an Ivy League college like Harvard or Princeton, but the town of Dixon, New Mexico, where they're celebrating Labor Day. I'm here to meet Einar Kvaran. Today, he's playing drums in his band. But at home, he's a quiet revolutionary. Einar is part of a remarkable endeavor that uses the web to allow ordinary people to create something extraordinary. He's a legendary and prolific contributor to Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia that's becoming the most important information source in the world. When I first heard about it, I thought this is the craziest thing. This is, can't possibly even happen. How can you have have something that anybody in the world can edit, how can you trust it? Um, what's even the point of it? More than 65 million people around the world use Wikipedia each month. And instead of just accessing knowledge, they can author and edit it. The site's 14 million articles are the result of anonymous contributions from people like Einar, who don't need any formal qualifications. I have a list of something over a thousand articles. If anyone makes an edit in that article, it will appear on my checklist. And if I disagree with it, I will undo it. And then if they disagree with my undoing, they can undo it. So that, that's kind of the basic premise is that anybody in the world who has access to a computer can get on and edit the information. The idea is that instead of truth, knowledge, and accuracy being agreed on by experts and handed down by an elite from above, it will slowly emerge from the masses and come up from below. But by challenging centuries of scholarship, this new form of people power 
has ignited a huge argument.